Victoria's Secrets model, breast cancer thriver, Christine Handy with mullet champion, proud flatty, Sears, flat out secrets. Christine, um, tell me a little bit about how your life has kind of changed since going flat. Because, I mean, you were a model, a fashion model, and you still are. But how has your life changed, really? I mean... Going flat. Um, it, well, it, obviously, externally, it's changed because I had implants and, well, I had breast cancer in 2012 and then had implants put in. But since my implants, I they were excavated in 2020 because I had a MRSA infection in my implant. There is a, such a thing as breast implant illness. It exists. And it affects a lot of people. Although some doctors say that doesn't exist. It's kind of like chemo brain. When some doctors say chemo brain doesn't exist, no. makes me want to explode. Cause I had that too. Ooh, and to dis dismiss people's reality is unacceptable. And so, yeah, I know you want to get into that one. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say the thing about it is talking to a friend of mine, that's a nurse and she's like wanting to go off her tamoxifen. Cause it's just, I think that's the one for the, that you have to be on for like 10 years. Uh -huh. And it's just really affecting her and she wants to go off of it and she's a nurse. So her nurse brain goes, no, but her as a person, I said, you got to quit thinking about textbook. You got to think about real life. And that's what the doctors only think about is textbook because they haven't lived this and they don't have a clue about chemo brain being real or breast implant illness. And they don't want to, how is there a doctor that only does explants? That's all he does. You know what I mean? If, if, if breast implant illness isn't real, then how is there doctors that that's all they're doing? Well, okay. We, I, I believe there's so much dismissal in our world, especially right now, which is a really sad thing in particular in the medical space. Mm -hmm. So we have to have voices like ourselves who say, one, these things do exist and two, there's other options. And so going back to the question, how do I live differently now that I'm flat, I have a bigger purpose and I have a different, it, it's, it's kind of like you go down the highway and then you can take a right or a left. I've taken a right. And my right is I've gone back to modeling because I have a concave chest. I've gone back to modeling because I think that being represented, the people that have gone flat, chosen to gone, chosen to go flat, which is kind of an interesting thing. I don't, because nobody chooses breast cancer, right? So to choose to go flat, it's an option because you either go flat or you put implants in, right? Or do you do the flap and there's, there's other options, but we don't choose breast cancer. And so to, to be flat is, is, a, is an option. And that's an option that I am in and, and you are as well. And there's a whole community of people that are out there that want to be heard and seen. And so what I felt like I needed to do when I, my implants were excavated was to represent a community of people that wanted to be represented, that needed to be represented because it was unfair that not enough people had that, to, had that option. Because if we don't know that we have an option that we don't, we can't make that decision. And so when I first, when this happened to me, I decided that I was going to go back to modeling and my modeling agency basically said, no. They said, you know, we're just not, we, we're not sure about this. And, and that was okay for me because we always have no's in our life. Oh yeah. But that can't stop us. It's a self-esteem issue for me. If my modeling had, agency had said no, and I said, oh, and I shrunk, right? Emotionally shrunk and said, oh, maybe this is unacceptable. Maybe this is, is unsightly. Then, then I wouldn't be a voice, but they sure. had they had nothing to do with me, right? They had, yes, they could have represented me and they decided not to, and that's fine. Like, I don't, it's, there's no, I have no issue with them. They didn't see what I could see. And so I just decided that on my own, I would do it. And with my manager, she and I both figured out a way. And ultimately I walked in New York Fashion Week. I've, I've worked, I've walked in New York Fashion Week four seasons and I did Miami Swim Week in a bathing suit. And, and that represented, people that wanted to be seen. And so subsequently, um, we've worked with different brands, like we've talked about Victoria's Secret, but also other brands to, to, to show that your beauty really is internal. My self, my self esteem and my self worth comes from inside. Mm -hmm. I'm not rooted in external value. I'm not rooted in society's opinion of me. 
And I've had people say to me, your, your chest is disgusting. I went back into the dating world. Yeah. Well, well, well hold on. <laughs> I went back into the dating world with a concave chest. Cause my ex-husband and I went through a divorce right before it happened. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, okay, well now I mean, I don't want to live the rest of my life alone. I want to be in a relationship. That was a personal decision of mine. And I was a little timid to go back into the dating world with this. I have to be honest with you. It, it, it was, even though I have a really strong self-esteem, I was a little bit intimidated, but I wasn't going to let that stop me. And so ultimately I started to date and there was one gentleman who I'd never met, but we were talking in California. And he basically said to me, I've read some articles about you. I think what you're doing is amazing. And I'm really proud of what you're doing, but I think your chest is disgusting. And I actually wrote an Instagram post on it because I said, I've been hired by the biggest, I've been hired as a model, the biggest job that, that same week I was hired by a company to do the biggest modeling job I'd ever done. I was getting paid more. It was bigger visibility. The same exact week that gentleman said that my chest was disgusting. So my Instagram post said, which voice do you think I listened to the modeling job or the guy's voice? And the truth was, I didn't listen to either. I listened to my voice yeah. because it didn't matter if I got the biggest modeling job of my life that week. It didn't matter that the guy said that if I was rooted in self-confidence, all of that is noise. And I think that's the most important thing that I can share with anybody is how I feel about myself, because I can only speak about myself, is what I will show the world. And it is what I will show myself. So if I show courage to myself, I'm showing courage to the world. If I show fear to myself, then I'm showing fear to the world. If I show insecurity to myself, then I'm showing insecurity to the world. I don't want to show insecurity to me. I don't want to be fearful. So I live a different life, more rooted in faith, more rooted in self-esteem with a concave chest than I ever have. Because my dependency on the world, my dependency on my figure is less and less. It's not just an age issue where you, where you become more mature. It's also a, my, my, my physical self was, you know, cut up. I mean, they took a part of my body off. Oh yeah. We've been amputated. You know, people We've like been amputated and it's not our choice. We don't want to be amputated. I mean, and so, and, and, and I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to get into I'm only talking about breast cancer here. I'm not getting into anything else in society. It's not my, I, it's not my place. It's not my, it's not my, it's just not, I, I'm story. Not, it's not my story. And so all I can speak about is my experiences. And so to be amputated and to, to know I've been amputated and to take that mentality and say, okay, well, I've been amputated and now I don't want to face the world or I've been amputated. And now I want to celebrate this because this is beautiful. And there are other people out there like me. That's my focus. So which way are you going to go, right or left? Which right. which is your focus, right? And it really is. It's an internal focus. It is. And, you know, back to the dating thing, a lot of flatties really struggle with that. Like, you know, and I, for a little bit, it was in the back of my head, you know, I'm a lesbian. Um, yeah, but you were dating. I mean, regardless if you like women or men, it doesn't matter. It's just right. dating, right? Right. And it was in the back of my head, women lesbians want a woman with boobs because you know they don't want a man and I'm like but you know and I was just like uh and then I was just like I met a flatty online and she just taught me that this was I I if I ever which I don't think I ever will date again because I don't have time but if I did I guarantee you it'll be a flatty because I think this is the scar is hotter than breast now and I used to be a boob person big time and now I'm just like eh, nah, not attractive to me it's weird how perspective does change now, for the other flatties that are starting to date, what would you tell them, you know, because like I had um, open blazer, no, no shirt on, on my profile picture, because you know what, if you don't like it, fuck off, you know, <laughs> that's just who I am. Um, but what would you, like advice would you give them, you know, if they're getting into the dating world and stuff like that? Well, and I don't want to dismiss how bad they feel, right? No. Or the fear that they feel, because it's valid. When it first happened to me, I, you know, took me a while to even go into my closet and figure out what I could wear. And I was afraid to do that. I was afraid to go into my closet and figure out, gosh, this is my favorite dress. I can't wear it anymore. This is, 
but I also chose not to use prosthetics, right? That's a choice too. And, and so once I, once I emotionally went through the steps and I guess the steps were more and more introspection about who I was inside more and more time spending what I was rooted in. Was I rooted in society and society saying that if you have breasts, then you are, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I guess I don't want to label it, but or it's expected, right, to have breasts, or it's expected to have reconstruction, or it's expected to keep trying to have reconstruction. I I had to figure out what I was rooted in. And I just, I, I really, I just reject anything, most things from society these days, because I'm just paving my own way without judgment. And if people don't like my way, it's cool. I'm good with that. But if I pave my way and it's based on society's opinion of me, I'll never feel good about myself. That's true. Because uh, we, all, we constantly have arrows. We have great days with a, a brand saying here, we're going to give you this modeling can contract. And we have people who are saying that's disgusting. That's always going to happen. There's going to be good. There's going to be bad. There's going to be evil. There's going to be highlights, right? Like the highlight reel on social media. But that is not the only thing. And so if I focus on what society thinks of me, or if I focus on the modeling jobs, or if I focus on the haters, then my self-esteem is going to just be destroyed. So I focus on who I am inside my character and who, and what I'm, and what I'm trying to do, which is inspire. And that, and then I, I walk around without any fear or any transaction and also without caring about the outcome, Right. It's crazy because uh, cancer has, for me, well, like I told you before, it's, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. It gave me more self-confidence. It made me love myself more. I never would have walked around in just a sports bra before. And here I go without a shirt on the interwebs and on stage. And it's like, I, you know, in my best fitness, when I was running mini marathons and stuff and 5Ks all the time, I would never have walked around in just a sports bra. And now I'm a little heavier and, <laughs> and no boobs. And I just go topless like nothing. And it's it's the oddest thing for me that it just, it's like now I don't give a shit what anybody thinks because I know I'm helping people by doing that. I don't do that for me. You know, that would be silly. Why would I, you know, but I do that because it does help so many other people. Like what you're doing is helping so many people when that first came out, they put it on the page and or when they saw that, they put it on the page and they're like, hey, look, they were so ecstatic that there was a Victoria's Secrets model that was flat, you know, and boobless like them. And they just, they were like, what? Well, yeah, you can be beautiful without boobs. You know, there's- No, not we, we can, we are. We yeah, are. well, if you are, you are, you know, if you're, so we're, if you're so we are. inside, then yes. I mean, it doesn't matter what you look like, you know, as far as boobs go or not. Exactly. So I think what you are, just described was you showed courage during your journey. You proved to yourself that you're a courageous woman, right? And what does courage do? It builds self-esteem. Yeah. So then you had all this courage and you had all this self-esteem because you're like, no, I can stand up for myself because so often we freely give that courage to other people. We freely show up for other people. But when you are faced with life and death and you are faced with a diagnosis, you either are going to show up for yourself or, or quit. You said to yourself somewhere, I'm going to show up for myself. I'm going to fight this disease. And each day that you did that, you were building your self-esteem and you came out of it more courageous than you were before. Sure. And I think, that's, and I think that's where you, you have built your self-esteem. Yeah. And so there's so many people who are, are doing that path, right? But there's also people who are paralyzed in fear. And those are the people that we're trying to help. For sure. They haven't built their self-esteem yet because they, they're stuck in that paralysis of fear. And they're stuck in this paralysis of like, caring about what other people see. And so if we can share our stories of like, you know what, you showed up, this, these people that are afraid, you showed up for yourself as well because you're fighting this, this battle. But maybe look at it this way, like you're showing yourself courage each day. So let's celebrate that and let's, let's celebrate you. And so by storytelling and by podcasts and things like this, social media, which I think can be I think social media can be a self-esteem destroyer for a lot of women, but there's people out there like ourselves who are saying, okay, well, we're going to use social media as a tool to inspire and to give people hope. 
And the message is very clear. It's, it's not, this is not self-serving. It's for, it's, it's for the measure of saying, no, society shouldn't be your measure. It should be some build, build it on something that is sustainable. It can't be materialism because things can get taken away. It can't be people because relationships end, right? Oh, it can't, yeah. It can't be external beauty. We age, we have illness, we have scars, we get injured, et cetera. So my suggestion would be build it on something that you, nobody can take away. What can nobody take away? You. you. Yeah. Your self-esteem. Absolutely. And you know, it, it's some people just, they think that because we've all sexualized boobs, we all have, you know, and it's just like, they think that they are not a woman without boobs, you know, and these doctors push that. Well, you have to have them. You're too young. You're too pretty. And I think society in general, we've done that, you know, with the Hooters, with the Twin Peaks, with everything, you know, we've all gay, straight, male, female, we all like boobs, you know, at one point or another, we loved them, you know, and I think we've sexualized that. So it gets in people's heads that they have to have boobs to be a woman. And it's not true. You know, but I'm, that's, that's going back to being dependent on society. You know, it's it's funny because I'm more feminine now than I ever was. I Aww. never wore pink a day in my life. <laughs> I would refuse. And and you know, and I'm just, I don't know. It it got me more in touch with my feminality. Not that I'm feminine by any means, but it got me more in touch with my feminality. And I think maybe that whole hormonal hormonal with menopause and all that stuff maybe is part of that. But it. I don't know it without breast. I feel more feminine and I get asked if I'm on the wrong restroom less without boobs than I ever did before. <laughs> it's the weirdest well, thing. Here's a good visual that I think I, I do talk about. I speak about this because I think it's a good visual. We, we had to build a house in our life prior to cancer. And that house probably had a white picket fence and it was a way we want, we thought we were supposed to live life. Then we had to build a house in the cancer world, in the illness world. And, and that house was probably broken down and had some windows out and maybe the door was busted in. Now we have to build a different house. It's a different season of our life. And some of us have a build a house without a chest. It doesn't mean we can't have a, a, pick, a picket fence. It may be a different fence and maybe it's a pink fence. It doesn't matter, but it's a different house. And so if you can see it like that, because so many people get paralyzed and well, my life will never be the same without a chest. My life will never be the same prior post-cancer. That may be true, exactly. but is that, neg is that negative or positive? It's how you right? make it. It's how you make it. And so rebuild your house, build it the way you want. And build it better. You may not have a chest in that house, but that's okay. Rebuild it in a different way. And I, and I think that is a focus and if we focus on the negative, it will be negative. If we focus on what we're missing, then we will have, feel lack. Mm -hmm. If we focus on the emotional trauma over and over again, we're never going to get out of it. So instead of getting stuck in that paralysis and stuck in that quicksand where you're going to sink, leap off, build a different house, know that it's not going to be the same, but you can rebuild it. It's a different season in your life. And I always say, you know what? Cancer will make you bitter. It'll make you better. And it made me better. And I'll tell you what, that's the thing. People want their old life back so bad and it makes them bitter because, you know, instead of embracing the change, you know, I always say embrace the suck or the suck will embrace you. If you embrace the suck, you can make, I, I was a window salesman for 14 years, a good one too, make yeah. good money. And now I, I do this mainly full time and yes. comedy and acting, you know, some. And I never would have imagined I would be doing this or comedy or acting. And it's like my life, I wouldn't give it back for anything. I wouldn't go back to my old life. Right. And people cannot get past that because they think their old life was so good. But yet then they realize if they switch their mindset, wow, this is so much can be so much better if you embrace it and and take what you've learned from it. Because you had to have learned some lessons during cancer. You had to have. Well, even taking the narrative away about good or better or worse, just different. Yeah. Right. And maybe that's a little bit more calming to people because certainly my life is different and your life is different. But if you think about it, everybody's life changes. 
whether it's cancer, whether it's relationally, whether it's financially, we're constantly being changed. Yeah. It's how we react. It's how we react to pain and trauma that really dictates our future. And so we, you know, collectively, we're trying to share these stories of, of nuggets of how to, to move forward that will hopefully help other people because I know what stuck feels like. You know what stuck feels like. You know what pain and trauma look like and feel like. And, and sometimes I feel like the emotional pain is much harder than the physical pain. And so if we can give people tools, then we can maybe help them get out of that paralysis. And that's the goal. That's true. It's very true, you know, and, and we, I, I just, the flat community is, is such a tight knit community. And it's, it, I, I always say, you know, it's a, it's a family that you would never ask for, but once you have them, oh my God, it's just the most amazing group that you could ever have with you, you know, and loyal and there for you at all times. And it's just like, how did it take something so bad to create this amazing, these amazing relationships and things, you know, and I'm grateful for it. I really am. Yeah. Well, people, people feel, I think in general, people feel lost when they don't have a community. So if you're faced with now having a flat chest or concave chest, and you feel like you're out there on your own, it's very isolating. And so if you have people that are visible, right. And have communities where you can share and say, this is, I feel, I don't feel great today, or I feel amazing today, regard whatever. If you can contribute and you can feel like you're being seen and heard, that gives people hope. That gives people courage. We can lend our courage to other people by showing what it looks like to live a thriving life after a diagnosis. Yeah. And being seen and being heard is so important because there are so many people out there that don't know we exist and they think they're the only one and they're alone. I have message after message after message of these people saying, I've been all alone for 11 years. Never knew there was another flatty out there. and didn't know there was anybody else flat. And I'm like, how? In real life, I know between 15 and 20 people, not in groups. And there's five to six of them I've known for 20 plus years. Wow. If you think of that magnitude of how many flatties there really are in this world. But they, there's a couple of them I forget because they wear their, their foobs all the time, their prosthetics, you know. And, and that's fine. If that's what they're comfortable with, that's fine. But I forget they're flat sometimes because of that. Yeah. Matter of fact, one of them, I was at her surgery and I just invited her to the group like last month because I totally forgot that she was flat. But, you know, and I think that be, being in the group helps her too. You know, I, I know one of them, she doesn't wear her foobs near as often because she's been around the group. And we yeah. do a topless Tuesday because I started that back when somebody reported me for nudity when I posted my first topless picture seven years ago. I was like, wow. oh, don't tell me what not to do. So I started doing topless Tuesday every Tuesday because they reported me and I just was like, keep reporting. And they wouldn't take it down. Of course, Facebook was like, you're fine. And so I have, you know, I don't know if you know who Bert Kreischer is, the comedian, the machine. Yeah. I have pictures with him and I had pictures with all kinds of people topless because we have to be seen. We have to be heard because there are too many people out there that don't know we exist and don't know that when my breast surgeon didn't know we had a community of us, and she does an amazing flat closure. I mean, yeah. that says something. And there's too many people living in silence and all alone and that don't know. We have this amazing community of flat out love. It's, you know, and you see the map behind me and we're coming to them all. We're trying to get to all of them, you know, because they don't need to be alone because they don't have the money to get to a meetup or they can't travel to a meetup. You know, we have one in a wheelchair. She was crying. She's like, I didn't think I'd ever get to a meetup. And she goes, you guys are coming right to me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's a lot of people that are, you know, in, in the Midwest that haven't had the money to get out to California or Colorado for a meetup and they yes. feel really alone. So that's yeah. why we're trying to get to as many places as we can. You are. Because they are so alone and they, it's so sad. Yes. Nobody should feel alone. There's too many people in general. Well, well you're doing a good job. You're doing an amazing job. Thank you. And, you know, you though, I mean, that's huge for you. You have a, you're able to be seen a lot more than I am. And that is huge. You know, well, I, you know, I talk, I do talk about this because I think it's some, some people will say to me, yeah, but you, you have a long history of modeling. You have a bigger platform. And I say, no, that's not true. I, I, I do have a long history of modeling. I'm not saying that, but when I was diagnosed with cancer, I didn't feel like I had a voice in, in general, because my self-esteem was terrible, but 
it's every step that you take, which creates a voice. Everybody has a voice. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just, you know, in your, you know, coffee shop, it's still a huge voice because one affecting one person is a huge voice. You don't have to have a, a huge uh, following on social media to have a voice. That's, that's, that's not true. So I talk about it all the time. I mean, I went to breakfast for somebody's birthday and there was a flatty that went through, I didn't know she was a uni and she went through her breast cancer. I'd played softball, acquaintance friend, and we played softball together and she happened to be there. And she said, yeah, I'm a uni because she went through her journey the same time as me. So I didn't even, you know, it's, yeah. And I was like, you can join our group. She goes, I thought it was only, and I was like, no, no, uni, if you didn't reconstruct, you're absolutely, and her wife goes, please join that group, you know, she's, you know, and, and then there was another girl that said, hey, my sister just went flat, because I do talk about it, and at yes. the same breakfast, that was two different people. Wow, I yeah, mean, it's, unfortunately, there's more people than we think, that's sad, oh, right? A lot more. It's not it's sad just, that they're flat, but it's sad that breast, it's sad that they've been affected by breast cancer. I want to be very clear when I say well, but that. Here's the thing. I mean, unfortunately, there's not a cure. Well, there is. They're not giving it to us. But anyways, that's a whole other story. Until we are able to have that cure, to cure people, you know, at least we can help them after the fact with yes. the flat. You know, I mean, instead of having to go through all that reconstruction when they don't want it or and having to go through breast implant illness because they don't talk about breast implant illness. They deny yeah. this bill. They're like, oh, well, these moves, these implants are safe compared to the other ones. And if you go under the muscle or over the muscle or whatever, I don't know all of it. Like I said, yeah. not my story. But if we can help somebody from not having to go through all those surgeries that I've seen so many of my friends go through and so much pain and I did and lupus and stuff like that, I'm like, yeah. You know, Again, I'm just empowering people to to give them an option. Everybody has to have an option education, knowledge. education of those, of all the options, you know, and yeah. I've said before, I smoked for 23 years, but I carried the box around that said, they may kill you. <laughs> you know, I think the implant should have to carry the box around that has the black label, on it, you know, so they, because I mean, I think anybody that knows and is educated about it and still wants it, get them. Right. But yes. I think you need to be educated on that decision. I yeah. think you should have all that information, you know, I'll, I'll share a really a very interesting story bef before we wrap up. I was, okay, so the MERS infection took my implants and the, by the time it was during COVID. So it, the first time I was in the hospital was March 25th of 2020. Then they treated me for a staph infection. Uh, ultimately I was not treated with the right medication. They said I was fine. They sent me home with a nurse. I had a pick line for two weeks. In fact, the building that I live in in Miami when I got home, I think it was like April 1st, said I couldn't even come out of my home because that was the first three weeks of COVID. And they said, oh, well, you've been in the hospital. You've been exposed to people. They wouldn't even allow me to leave my home. And I was like, that is, so I ended up having to get a lawyer write a letter. It was a, it was a horrible experience. And then the end of April, the infection came out, it came back out. I was in the hospital again for five days and then ultimately treated with medication that worked but ultimately didn't work. Eventually in June of 2020, my chest, my the infection ate a hole in my breast. It was just massive infection behind my chest cavity because of the implant. And so when they extracted the implants, it the infection had eaten away a lot of my skin and I'm thin. And so, so my chest, there was no room for reconstruction. Yeah. There was no skin. There was not enough skin left for reconstruction. And they just said, okay, game over. And my oncologist or one of my oncologists had said to me, you know what? I have a doctor that you should talk to. And I think he could probably reconstruct. He could find maybe fat graft from other places and put skin here and da, da, da. And, and she said, I know you are a big voice in the flat community, but I also know I'm not even going to say the rest. She just basically said, I think you need to talk to this doctor because I think you should reconstruct. And I entertained the idea, not because I, I wanted to, at that point, I was like, I'm done with surgeries. I've had 23 surgeries. I'm so done. And, but I went to this person and I said to this person, when this doctor, when he walked in, I said, don't show me an implant. Don't even bring an implant in this room. If you can show me a way to reconstruct without an implant, I'm 99.9% .9 sure I'm not going to do it. 
but I'm here for my oncologist just to, just to have this conversation. Just, I mean, you know, actually it was more like, I think I was more like what I want to hear what they're telling other people. Then mm-hmm. I, I, I never wanted to do it. And nobody was going to force me to do it. I would never have done it, but I just was curious. So he goes, well, we are going to have to use a small implant. So he actually brings an implant in the room. Now I'm having like this massive panic attack in his office. And I'm looking at this implant like, Ugh. yeah, right. And he, he proceeds to tell me that it's going to be a, a 10 hour surgery, 10 hour surgery. They're going to have to cut my ribs open and, and to get a source of blood to the new skin that they're going to take from other places. I'm going to have to spend a, a time gaining weight to do this and on and on and on. And I was like, I left that office. I felt physically ill. And okay. I was like, I was like, do, do I, I, I don't, I felt so bad for the people who said yes to that kind of surgery because I'm good with how I look. Yeah. I feel happy. I feel joy. I love my body. I love my body. Same. Nobody can nobody can take that from me. And to go through something like that to make other people feel better is disgusting. You said joy, and I, I want to touch on that. You know, I thought I was happy before. I never really experienced true joy until after breast cancer. And I'll tell you what, that Colorado trip was probably the most joy I've ever felt in my life. And because, you know, and they asked me, they did a little documentary thing and they said, why do you do this? And I said, it's selfish. I do it for me because it brings me joy. And they yeah. said, well, I don't think that's really selfish. And I'm like, well, kind of, because it brings me joy, you know, to help these, you know, people that are lost and, and need this. And because I have always had a strong personality. I mean, the week I got diagnosed, we I was on the news. They came to the first benefit that we had, going pink for boobies at the hair salon, you know, first time I ever got pink in my hair. Yes. And the news came out and the news interviewed me four times during my breast cancer journey. Yes. It's I was always, everybody knew me because I don't know a stranger, you know, and it, I was a window salesman. So it wasn't like I was in entertainment or anything then. Right. My, my boxing coach goes, you have a big platform. I hope yes. you are good. And it didn't make sense at the time. And now it's just like, okay, I see, you know, I I see what he says because people do look to me for things because people call me about MS. They call me about cannabis if they need CBD or if they have breast cancer or this or that. And they contact me because I am so open about all of it, you know, my MS journey, my breast cancer and all this. And so, you know, I know a lot of people turn to me because they, they've seen that and they're like, Hey, what about this? You know, I just had a friend of 20 years contact me and say, well, I'm going to be in your group soon, mm. you know, and that's one of many of friends of 20 years, you know, it's, it's yeah. scary of how many, if it's one in eight, yes. you got to realize how many really, how many flats are really out there. There have yep. to be way more than we could even imagine. And we've ever found. That's one thing about TikTok with all this going on. I'm like, Oh, please don't ban it. Cause I've been able to find people that I never would have found on Facebook and Instagram, yep. you know, throughout the, we have platties throughout the world in our group. Right. They'll find you on Instagram. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. But you know, it's different. I, 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 just, I gotta get on that. I gotta get on Pinterest. I'll do that. Or maybe not today. Cause I'm busy today, but um, yeah, no, I'll have to look into that. So yeah, it's, it's crazy that so many people don't realize there are flatties out there because Kathy Bates is a flatty, but people don't know it because unfortunately to act, she wears prosthetics, you know, um, when she did the, the lip sync battle, she came out without prosthetics mm-hmm. and I was just like, yeah, you know, but people don't realize it because nobody is seen and nobody talks about it. And, and I think the more we talk about it and the more we're seen, right. Or people won't feel alone. Is, is my biggest thing. You know, I don't want them to feel alone just because they don't have boobs anymore. That's ridiculous to me. Yeah. Good for us. Well, good for you. I thought. <laughs> All right. Well, I thought Thank this was great. You. Thank you so much, Christine. I appreciate it. And um, I think you're beautiful with or without breast. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even have known had, I didn't know, you know, if, if I looked at your modeling pictures, because yeah. they're, you're skinnier and I, you know, I'm, you're, gorgeous. I wouldn't have paid any attention that you didn't have. Well, I would have now. 
because I was yeah. that. <laughs> but I wouldn't have otherwise, you know. So I do appreciate you helping out on this and, and really being a voice for people out there and being a, a beacon of hope for a lot of them, you know. Likewise. Thank you. Thank Let you. them know that you can live a great life after being flat. Yeah, you will. We will. Flat Out Secrets with Christine Handy and Sears.